Gary, it's a real pleasure to, uh, well, thank you for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to, to share uh, some of the work uh, that we've been involved in over the last few years. And it's also, of course, nice to see many familiar faces. <clears throat> Hopefully, one day we can do this in person again. And um, I've tried to keep the talk fairly general uh, and, um, in that uh, the first half will be more about GUS and then how to control them. So, as some of you know, I really like showing these videos of sparrows flying. I've been doing the same thing over and over again for years. And it doesn't have to be a sparrow, but the question always is, is how, how do these sparrows or any of these small scale flyers or swimmers for that matter, manage to perform in complex environments? And if you, this has already slowed down uh, a factor of 10, but if you slow, start to slow things down gradually, um, one thing becomes apparent and these, these flying bodies, if you will, have very, very well-tuned uh, sensor arrays um, that I will hope talk about in the second half of this, of this seminar. To start with, I guess, the way I look at these problems is that they're vortex for, uh, vortex formation tools. In other words, they they control and shed vortices in a real time manner in order to adapt to their environment. So there are a lot of parameters with which we can parameterize these types of problems. Uh, let me get a pointer out. So of course, there's some common some characteristic length scales that we can think about. But of course, beyond that, there are um, active sweep, twist, spanwise curvature that is performed on these bodies. So essentially they're morphing bodies. They're flexible. They have probably an adaptive flexibility if you think about how their muscles control, for instance, these feathers. And then you have all kinds of interesting effects, sort of rotational uh, stability of these vortices, uh, not to mention the fact that there's a strong sensitivity to Reynolds number uh, shear, uh, and of course, what I'll focus on today are the interactions of bodies like this with Gus. And so, of course, uh, we want to know how they can respond to Gus, how they respond, and then, of course, later we'll talk about how they might actually adapt or how we want to adapt. And so, the first thing to point out is that they have a little computer on board, if you want to think of it that way. And of course, there are some n number of distributed sensors with which they are controlling their, their performance. So the, the talk overview is as follows. We have a, a first part that I, I talk about our work on, on dust response specific to delta wings as part of um, an ONR project that was completed a, a year ago. And then the second part is more sort of an active project of ours looking at how to use um, distributed pressure sensing. So the, the initial motivation for the ONR project uh, was uh, to some extent um, related to the challenge of landing um, UCAVs on, on ship decks. As you can imagine at sea, you would have strong uh, wind shear and, and strong uh, wind states with which you would have to operate. And of course, the wing loading of smaller air vehicles, as we all know, will, will drop, which makes them more susceptible to aerodynamic disturbances in the, in the boundary layer, in the atmospheric boundary layer. So before I get into delta wings, um, we, we had sort of a weird, uh, perspective of unsteady separation points um, back in the day. This is already work from a former PhD student of mine five years ago. And what we, we considered was if you start out with a, a sphere and you consider a potential flow solution around the sphere, uh, under steady conditions, you will have a favorable and then an adverse pressure gradient as denoted by this light blue line where the acceleration modulus is zero, essentially. And of course, as you start to accelerate the sphere in the streamwise direction, which effectively is the equivalent of an axial gust, what happens is, if you want to imagine in a, from a potential flow point of view, is that you are to gradually, as you increase the acceleration coefficient, you are gradually reducing 
the strength of the adverse pressure gradient. Uh, in other words, you're moving closer and closer to a state, as you can see here with the dark blue line, where effectively the flow faces no uh, <clears throat> adverse, well, it has an adverse pressure gradient, but it's drastically reduced. And so we kind of hypothesize that rather than say having a separation line as denoted here between orange and blue, that the separation line would potentially move backwards during, during an, uh, a gust or during the axial acceleration. If any of this is weird or unclear, feel free to, 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 to ask, jump in. So I don't want to make it any more confusing than it has to be. Um, anyway, so uh, I'll get into this towing tank facility of ours in a minute, but essentially we took the sphere in a, a tank of water and measured the forces as we accelerated from rest and as we accelerated from a, from a terminal velocity to another terminal velocity. And long of the short, without getting into the details, is that when you plot the drag coefficient, instantaneous drag coefficient as a function of the distance traveled, so the S star is the number, the displacement of the body normalized by its diameter, you get, as, as we know very well, an initial, what we would call an added mass spike from the, the ball's response during acceleration. So the acceleration is limited to this short one diameter of travel. And then what's interesting is that uh, depending on whether you're under subcritical or supercritical conditions for the sphere, the, the, the force response can take up to something qualitatively on the order of four, five, even six body diameters. If you look at this green curve before it reaches uh, its more, well, even longer, you could argue, before it reaches more or less uh, a, a steady drag. And so what exactly might be happening? Well, I think and I'll show you in a second qualitatively what's going on, we get this formation of a, a vortex ring behind the body, which, as you can imagine, is playing a role in the uh, instantaneous separation line around the sphere and with that, the drag. So here, of course, since it's a towing facility and our camera is fixed in space, we're scanning across the flows coming from the right. And initially, it looks like a potential flow-like solution, uh, you know, with a boundary layer. Uh, of course, and then and as the as the if you look at the clock here, this is during the gust, you'll get the roll up in the in the leeward side of a vortex. This is a slice through that ring. And then with that, the onset of separation. And so it's an interesting phenomenon because, of course, we can't then use the quasi steady solution of our problems to look at these dynamic separation processes, just like in dynamic stall on an on an airflow. So. The question, of course, is what? how would a body like this one shown on the right, this non-slender delta wig, respond to a gust? And, you know, with the same sort of thought, we would expect that the separation line would move backwards in time as we have an increase in the free stream velocity during the gust. And conversely, if you lose uh, uh, the free stream velocity because of a negative axial gust, you would maybe expect a larger separation. So in other words, we have a separate a steady state condition with a separated uh, line, a separation line behind these this orange region. And then during the gust, as you move from one time step to the next, we would expect some type of reattachment process taking place. But of course, on a delta wing, we have these complex vortex structures uh, associated with these leading edge vortices. So the facility is, um, as some of you know, is a, it's a 15 meter long um, one by one meter cross section towing tank with a ceiling and it allows us to do some fairly high speed towing uh, experiments and accelerations and we've now actuated it with other degrees of freedom but for all intents and purposes it's sort of a conventional towing tank. Here's a picture of our delta wing upside down being towed uh, at a steady speed uh, through a trepids plane so the laser sheet is oriented um, if you want, the, the vector is oriented parallel to the motion of travel. And so you can imagine as you move down the tank, you can accelerate and decelerate the, the body accordingly to emulate the axial gust. I'll be focusing on axial gust today, but a lot of these kinds of ideas can be um, related to transverse gusts and other types of gust motions. The, the model um, was instrumented with uh, an array of pressure taps that were then 
basically 3D printed and then run up through the sting to the free surface, which is a little bit annoying to do in water. And essentially we used a, a daisy chain arrangement to extract the, the pressure. And doing this in water uh, is, is, I find, or we found is to be very problematic. So I'm always open to suggestions if anyone has done this in water, probably not. Um, and then for today's purpose, we're just showing you sort of the <clears throat> plain Jane PIV, planar PIV. And again, I have to remind you that the field of view is fixed in space, but the body's traveling through, which makes for a, a quite a nuisance and a lot of work to do these reconstructions. But it gives us then a representation of the separation on these three planes of interest. Um, I feel always silly showing planar PIV in front of uh, all these uh, researchers in Delft doing fancy um, 3D reconstructions, but the few times we tried shake the box, for instance, or tomo reconstructions in our towing tank, it was uh, the calibration through the glass was was an absolute nightmare. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, here we have a, a representation of the axial gust program. So you start the model from rest, you hit a, a, a effectively a steady Reynolds number where the flow has relaxed to quasi steady conditions. And then you you then hit this this initial condition, if you will, here with a steady uh, a constant acceleration, and until you reach a new terminal velocity of fifty percent higher than that of the initial condition, and of course you can do it with more aggressive accelerations or more uh, or slower accelerations, which we prescribe as G star, which is the length of the gust normalized by the mean chord of our body. Again, if you have any questions, just, just jump in. It wouldn't, wouldn't be an issue to, to answer. Um, so, so the initial conditions, um, here's our steady response. So if we focus on the blue body, that's our, our NACA 12 uh, non-slender delta wing, has a 45 degree sweep angle. Um, you can see how it has sort of a very, very benign lift curve over a large range of angles of attack, as you would expect. Drag drill goes up enormously, and then you have a very strong um, pitching moment associated with the stalling process. And so we've decided in, in, in these experiments to really focus our attention on 20 and 30 degrees because there's a similar amount of lift being generated as an initial condition. But the mechanism is very different because in the 20 degree case, the flow is sort of attached. If you want to think of it, well, attached may be a generous word for a delta wing. But the, the initial condition, as you can imagine, by looking at the drag is considerably different between 20 and 30. And then you'll see this shortly. So let's start out with the pressure mapping and the forces. So what you're seeing here is a pressure coefficient using a cubic interpolation on the surface describing first steady states, so these are, and now unsteady, so during the gust, you'll see with the dark blue where you get strong suction associated with the reattachment process during the gust, and then a relaxation back to um, steady state. So let's focus on the bottom left. If you look at 30 degrees initial angle of attack, flow is more or less stalled, a very rapid gust, and then when you hit steady state, you'll see the clock ticking, you jump and lift, and you get a very strong suction on, on this at least section of the um, wing before it relaxes down. And a similar trend is observed for other cases. So we'll focus primarily just on 30 degrees. So, so, so if we look at the, the lift response here, for instance, 30 degrees G star one, which is the fastest gust, you get a very, very dramatic rise in lift. You get actually in a weird inflection and then you have this sustained lift all the way out to about, let's say, eight body lengths or eight core lengths before it joins the rest of the uh, aerodynamic response uh, curves returning to steady state. So it's a very uh, dramatic uh, problem. And of course, from the point of view of a control uh, of, 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 of a body like this, it would be a, you know, a mess. If we look at the the flow, the axial component of velocity, you can see very nicely during the gust, so the gust has already started how the flow more or less reattaches and you get this 
Uh, in the inboard sections, you get this reattachment process, so this uh, stagnation point moving downstream on these two planes. And if I jump right ahead for sake of time to the vorticity on these planes during the gust, again, the clock just started, you'll see this very tightly wound vortical region near the leading edge. And that's responsible for that suction. And then outboard, though, the flow continues to stall. And so it's kind of a, a tale of two regions. The inboard regions reattach and the outboard sections remain very much stalled during these gust events, even though there's a very strong, as we know, spanwise flow on a swept wind like this. So it's an interesting phenomenon. Uh, perhaps in retrospect was too complicated for us to study, but uh, on the other hand, uh, there is a lot of interest in responses on more realistic plan forms and not just airfoils. Um, okay, so that's that. I will, um, I don't know how long the seminar is supposed to be. I, I deliberately didn't want to have a very, very long talk, but I'm going to focus now um, the remaining half uh, uh, on this business of uh, network science and how to use this potentially in in controlling problems like the delta wing that we just looked at. And so we return to our, our lab mascot flying. And as we slow things down, we, we can look at this again as not just a formidable aerodynamic body or device or inspiration, but also as a very, very sophisticated sensing system where its feathers double not only as, and we, we probably all thought about this, but I'm just to make it clear, we, they double not only as actuating surfaces, but also as a distributed sensing surface. And so I've drawn these red dots here as an indication of some nominal number of sparse sensors. And so the question that comes to mind is, just like in the lab when we're doing our experiments, what can we do when we get a sparse uh, number of measurements. So we don't always have the luxury of having a very highly resolved pressure signal. We haven't been able to do, for instance, uh, you know, it would be lovely to do pressure sensitive paint on our models, PSB, and get very refined pressure distributions. But in practice, we're always limited to some small number of pressure sensors. And these sensors at high Reynolds numbers or in unsteady cases are invariably also very noisy and and so we really want to ask ourselves, how do we deal with a problem like that? So I was at a uh, EFOSR review meeting, uh, or maybe it was ONR, anyway, long, many years ago, and Sam Tyra, for those of you who, who've, who've had the pleasure of meeting him, was presenting uh, his work and their group's work on network theory. Uh, initially, it was motivated on, on sort of more abstract concepts and turbulent flows, but then um, in, in low order modeling for aerodynamic problems. And so the, the, the typical, the way that they presented it was, well, we have a complex system, something that's at first glance too complex, and they want to reduce it by clustering data into communities as shown qualitatively in this diagram, such that you get a system with reduced comp complexity um, where you have edges relating nodes with, with one another, and each of these edges um, has a weight describing the relationship between one node and the next, and that edge not only can have a weighting, but can have, of course, also a directionality. So in other words, you can, you can be more weighted in one direction than in the other. Um, not sure... I'm certainly not an expert in, in network science, so I'm not sure at what level I should be introducing these things, but hopefully this is appropriate. So, of course, we can think of it in the context of um, uh, uh, Von Karman Wake. And what they did was very clever. They said, well, we're running a simulation at, uh, you know, with a he relatively large number of degrees of freedom. We don't really want to in develop a low order model or reduced order model based on this, you know, hundreds of thousands of nodes or solutions, but rather we want to reduce the complex complexity. And what they did was they just said, well, let's cluster all the all the data in these are well, I wouldn't say arbitrary, but in these vortices as colored here. And so then they had 
six communities in this case. And then by relating the strengths between each of these vortices or each of these communities to one another and with the actual body, they were able to develop a very robust uh, model relating lift and drag. And as you can imagine, the vortices in the immediate wake of the cylinder, of course, played a much larger role on the force than, for instance, a vortex that had been shed much earlier downstream in the wake. And so this is an example of taking network theory and reducing the complexity and making it more amenable to a model. But conversely, the reason why I show this beautiful satellite uh, video of uh, the carbon shedding behind an, an island, let's say 10 kilometer length scale, is that we, um, we also have in experiments, especially the opposite problem where our, our um, measurements are too sparse and we want to basically fill in the gaps. So we don't have too much data. Of course, the satellite video is beautiful, but let's say we have a couple buoys or a couple weather stations in this field of view, we wouldn't have the, the information necessary to reconstruct this complex wake. So on that note, uh, another really uh, lovely piece of work was published um, very recently by Frenet and et al. Um, uh, Bernard Nowak and Richard Seyman are, are co-authors on this, and for, for those of you who know them, and they, they looked at a clustering approach to reconstruct dynamical systems. So, you know, these two on the bottom are fluid dynamics examples. Perhaps the easiest one to describe qualitatively is just your, your heartbeat, your, your ECG, which has has a reproduce, you know, some somewhat reproducible shape, but of course we know it's not perfectly. Uh, it's not a. I don't know. I wouldn't. Maybe I'm dangerous saying this, but it's not a stationary system in that there are always slight very variances from one uh, heartbeat to the next. But anyway, and when you plot when you plot the the time traces in a phase space, as we've seen in other examples you get this ability to cluster data into critical nodes as depicted by these black nodes here. And then with that degree, that representation, one is able to, with some input data, develop a representation and, and validate and effectively reconstruct the time series based on a new signal that's somewhere moving around inside this phase space. So in other words, you need to collect some data generate a phase space and once you've gener generated this representative phase space in principle you can add additional uh, a new signal and that new signal depending on where it is in this phase space will um, by knowledge of this phase space you can then reconstruct its its time trace going backwards so with that in mind uh, the idea that always kind of bothered me personally was how does, for instance, a nestling uh, manage to fly on its first leap of faith, right? So I don't know if this is a, a good example, or maybe they just fall to the ground and, and brush themselves off. But regardless, there, there, there is some flight school available to nestlings, but I think a lot of it has to be learned. And I don't know, of course, what level of this is innate, but you know, when I compare the brain capacity of, a, of a, one of these birds, to my my youngest family member who just learned to walk a year ago and watch you know there's a video of his first steps the the ability to learn and reproduce uh reasonable motions even on land is pretty challenging enough so i always struggle to imagine how would a, a nestling jump out of the net uh, out of it out of a tree <clears throat> without killing itself so here we are with a representation of of our generic uh, flight vehicle with a little brain, some sensing, and some complex uh, vortex dynamics that we don't really know much about. We have some time traces of these sensors, so these three sensor pressure sensors represented by these three pressure traces. And then we can say, well, what does happens in nature? So for instance, when you look at a common house fly as you swat it, it has some enormous number of uh, of sensors that are being actually vast majority of its brain is you being used to process its its you know myriad of sensing systems which is actually quite surprising because I somehow assumed they weren't very sophisticated at all 
So uh, that's one way of doing it. Basically, if you have enough sense sensors, you don't need any physics, you just measure. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, you have, well, I wouldn't say it's the other end of the spectrum, but in bat, in the case of bats, they have hairs distributed over their uh, flight surfaces. And there have been some studies where they, let's say, give uh, the, the bats a little haircut and look at their ability or lack of ability to to control in complex environments. So the hairs actually have been shown to provide feedback for um, maneuvering, which is interesting as well, because we always assume bats only use echolocation. And finally, the common example that, that comes to mind is the lateral line on fish, where uh, we have essentially a sear, an array of ears, if you want to think of it that way, that run along the body's length on both sides and, and sometimes in, in the face. And what's fascinating, of course, is that um, cave fish, so this is actually an adaptation of the same species without eyes living in the dark that uses only um, its distributed pressure system to navigate in complex environments in the dark. So we use this learn model, presumably the fish then develops a learn model and a type of state estimation, which then can be used to then feedback and control um, as new boundary conditions are imposed. So um, there have been some strategies that have been explored. Here we basically have our problem with pressure in this case and say loads like lift, drag, pitching moment, yawing moment, whatever it would be. So we have yellow as the, in this case, pressure data and red would be forces moments. And then we have a low order model in this case would be a phase space and then uh, state estimation. And so this low order model will be probably the primary focus today or in the last few minutes of this talk where um, there have been a number of uh, studies um, ranging from linear mapping on an, a, you know, a standard lifting surface, attached flow, where um, in this case, sort of they're trying to improve the flight mechanics of an of a unmanned body to using artificial neural networks with um, pedostatic and static ports. Um, then more sophisticated models. Uh, this is from uh, Jeff Eldridge's group. And finally, combining um, artificial neural networks and, for instance, leading edge suction parameters. So in other words, you have some distributed number of pressure sensors and you can then use that to infer uh, your state. Now, the thing that perhaps bothers us a little bit, although this work is phenomenal, is that often these are cherry picked on cases, say at a Reynolds number of 100, uh, they're 2D and they're in some senses relatively, um, you know, when you train a neural network on a very s relatively simple problem, then it, it tends to work well. But what happens when you get away from that fitted area, if you will. So what happens when you get into nasty 3D flows at high Reynolds numbers with lots of noise, basically? And so that's the focus of, of where we're going. We're focusing on noisy data, sparse data, and we're asking ourselves, okay, maybe my collaborator, <clears throat> who Melissa Green, who's now at the uh, University of Minnesota, maybe using some type of topological analysis, we can improve the estimation. If instead of treating it like a black box, we can include some flow physics in the low order model. Uh, we have to explore what the best low order model would actually be, which will be something I talk about in the next few minutes. And then effectively, what would be the, the result when you have very limited training data? So in other words, it's one thing if you can train for, for weeks and weeks and weeks in a wind tunnel, and then you've basically encountered every possible scenario. It's another thing if you have a couple seconds of training data before you crash to the ground like a nestling would do. So the low order model uh, as depicted by this box can be is something as simple as a linear mapping, which is something that we've uh, tried. And it's, a, it's interesting because it's simple. Can be uh, an artificial neural network with several layers, including a physics uh, layer, if you want to think of it that way. And it can go as far as having uh, what, we're, what we're focusing on right now are uh, something like complex networks. So the linear mapping approach is nothing other than taking uh, 
your um, series of, in this case, pressure measurements denoted by yellow circles, and then coming up with uh, an array a matrix of coefficients beta that fit the data. And so this fit basically would have to be done based on knowing, having some train data. So here's a lift as a function of distance traveled for a gust at 10 degrees mean angle attack. So this is the geometric angle of attack, 20 degrees and 30 degrees. And so what the, the, the regression effectively is, is taking, this is pressure one, these are the pressure, this is the pressure, uh, well, this is the phase space. So you have some curve that relates pressure and, and lift. And then you, for a specific angle of attack, you would find the alpha specific plane to satisfy these this matrix beta where you can imagine that beta naught, beta one, beta two can be represented based on this slice through phase space. And as you can see, the green line does a decent job actually of reproducing the dynamics of these gusts. But when you now add, uh, you know, that's a, that's a specific. So basically you have to fit every single case and test upon itself, which is sort of like cheating. But what now happens if you take all the train data and you find a mean? So let's say you have a bunch of curves like this, you fit a, a line, you get an aggregate fit, and you come up with the mean beta values in your matrix. And then you see that, well, you're, it's a compromise, so you start to get some serious uh, deviations. Uh, it does still an okay job if you want to think of it based on, if you blur your eyes, it's okay, but it's really, you can tell how things will break down. So in other words, a universal fit is only possible when you have a large number of sensors. And once you have a large number of sensors, you basically don't need a technique anyways. So it was a good first study. We learned something from it. Um, and now we're moving into um, uh, using uh, these uh, network approaches. So in other words, the the mapping with uh, a, linear, a linear mapping is 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 nice but if you have signals that are collinear it breaks down and you have you're very then sensitive to placement of sensors you need to know a priori where to put the sensors and that's of course not always possible so I'll, i won't talk about the artificial neural network we were playing a bit with this but we haven't made much progress yet so let's talk about the complex networks approach so here we have uh pressure measured we have loads that we use to train our pressure data and potentially we have in these green vectors some other information about the flow physics, um, which is at this point optional. So we can ignore these green uh, vectors if you want, but we imagine in phase space, a relationship between all the pressure sensors, the loads, and possibly other information that can be mapped out. So if we simplify this, we have pressure, one pressure sensor, one aerodynamic load, and possibly another feature of our flow. And we can plot the time trace uh, of, of some train data in there, as shown with this black, dash, black dotted line. And then we can downsample and generate these orange uh, nodes. And what's really cool is we can then also start to develop uh, an, 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 some knowledge about the transition probabilities between nodes. So in other words, if you're at this node uh, in, in phase space, there's maybe a 50% probability that you would move up to this node versus moving down to another state. And so it's not just a, a spaghetti path in phase space, but it also gives you information about the likelihood of where you will move along uh, one of these um, traces. So here we have this downsampled uh, space. And then you can imagine from a top view, if you don't have this additional axis in green, for instance, you have an ambiguity. In other words, you can't discern where you are on the line from a 2D projection, but having some knowledge about, for instance, the vortex topology or some physics in the problem, you can discern between this blue point and these blue points up here, which we know then in 3D looking at this that are completely different, right? So it's an issue of ambiguity or trying to fight the ambiguity. If this works, then like I said, we have sort of the, the makings of a state estimation process. And so the idea is that we're combining data input with, with transition networks and the idea is we could integrate physics in, in a model like this. So it's not just a glorified regression analysis, it's 
is sort of a mixture between statistics and knowledge of possibly how vortices shed in time. So to, to just finish up, uh, to keep things, uh, I realize it's dinner, well, it's not dinner time, it's probably time for a beer uh, in, in Delft. Um, so, so let's look at a very simple test case. It's an elliptical plate. Uh, was initially motivated by a completely different problem, but we, we integrated two differential pressure sensors across the plate surface. And so we accelerated the plate and it has some normal force. So you can see the normal force during the acceleration jumps up, it relaxes to some steady state, and then it, it drops down when we decelerate. So we have an acceleration phase, a steady phase, and a deceleration phase. And then with that, we have pressure, uh, two differential pressures, CP1 is in the center, which is a solid line, and CP2 is at the three-quarter position on the major axis. So you can see it also has, there's a difference between the two. So these are for, for a bunch of training cases, different angles of attack. And you can see that, you know, the red nodes give you the individual states in phase space. It's nice because with two pressure sensors and one normal force, we can actually visualize this in 3D. But if you have 15 sensors and three loads, uh, then this becomes a mess to visualize. I'm not, it becomes, becomes a lot harder, let's say, to explain in a simple manner. So what's nice is that we have, the, um, we have these traces, but then we have ambiguities where we overlap between these cases. So what do we do? Uh, the sort of the standard or more accepted approach would be using a weighted average transition network. So in other words, what that means is that at some time instant, you have a pressure one and a pressure two, which gives you these two positions. So down here, and you're projecting upwards to, to, uh, to the, the normal load. So this red point here, which will then be somewhere in the phase space situated next to some train data at alpha one and another train path at alpha two. And you can then build up neighbors and weight the neighbors if you want. And then once you have this, these, these weighted neighbors and you, you can then develop um, what are called target nodes, which are predicted as shown by these purple arrows based on the trajectories of these two train paths. So this is known, this line is known, and then we're saying, well, then we're probably going to be moving upwards in this trajectory because this one's moving up and this one's moving up. So then you jump to the, the next step and you look at that next step. Uh, position, uh, and then it becomes kind of a, an iterative process. Based on this next position, you can go back and do a, a new weighting, uh, if you will. And so with that, you are able to generate, if you look here on the right, a video where red is the estimated path and black is the actual value for a, not, a case that hasn't been trained yet. And so we, if you zoom in on this uh, problem, let me see if I can play it, we're zooming in closer, the red point is trying to follow the black point. So you can see at times there's a huge error and other times it does a reasonable job, but in any event, we're dealing with a case that has yet to be trained. So we're using existing train data that's somewhere else to predict how it will perform at a new angle. And so as you can see, the black line for force is the actual curve. So you get a little spike and then it you know, relaxes and drops. And then the red curve is the estimated path. And you know, at a first glance, it's not too bad. There's actually a lot more that can be done. It's, we've included this in our latest manuscript where you can use the time history to reduce some ambiguities, but I won't get into that today. You're welcome to, I can always share the, the link for, for anyone who has interest. And the, the last slide of the talk at this point is on trying to then use something like um, Bayesian inference, where you, you get into the world of very noisy data, which is real, obviously, we all know. And you're now trying to use something about the probability. So initially, you have, uh, you assume some equal probability as denoted by this purple field. So you assume a Gaussian distribution in in you know this is uh you're right you're at your red point and you're trying to figure out where you are in phase space and what you do then is you go into the transition space and you have probabilities of moving from one node to the other and vice versa so big arrow mean or thick arrow means a high probability and a small arrow means a, a low probability 
And you can use this type of information, this trained information, to then move backwards and refine continually the um, estimate through Bayes' theorem. In other words, you can get a better expectation or of your probability distribution as you as you cycle through between evidence and transition space. And once you do that, you're able to then, in principle, generate uh, a value for for your point. And also, what's what's very useful is an estimate of its uncertainty. And with an estimate of its uncertainty, you get then a reconstruction of the black curve on which is the red line, but also sort of uh, the error bounds. In other words, how how confident you are that the red line is actually tracking the black line. So this is uh, this is a work in progress. Uh, the Frieder and Giovanni, who've been working on this very carefully, are are you know much better to answer any questions on, on this. But let me let me wrap up just by acknowledging all the the, the students and researchers uh, who've been working on these topics. Um, Giovanni is now a lecturer at the University of Surrey. Uh, many of my students have moved on to greener pastures. My collaborator on on the uh, Delta Wing research is now at University of Minnesota. I don't know if anyone uh, knows Melissa. She does a lot of work on LCS and things like that. And of course, the the funding for these various projects. And of course, feel free to reach out to me if you have specific questions after. Um, with that, I'll take any questions.